Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I understand that this evening we won't have any particular theme. We'll ask questions all over the map within the general field of psychology. Okay, would you like to begin? What role can the natural sciences play in the study of consciousness? Well, I assume you mean the natural sciences other than psychology the biological sciences principally. They have a very important role to play because we have to remember that consciousness, the phenomenon of consciousness, operates through the mechanism of the brain and nervous system. And there is a two-way causal interaction. We know that conscious states affect neurophysiological states and we also know that neurophysiological states affect conscious states. And since we know this, obviously psychologists will at many points work in cooperation with biologists, with physiologists, with neurologists, with endocrinologists, and other subspecialties within the field of biology to devise studies and experiments whereby the nature of the interaction between consciousness and brain and nervous processes can be better understood. I'm sure that many of you have read of some of the experiments wherein certain areas of the brain are stimulated with resulting changes in conscious states of a sensory or emotional nature. And here we see some attempts to learn something about the areas of the brain which are involved or chiefly involved in those sensory or emotional processes. I don't wish to imply by any of the foregoing that phenomena of consciousness are going to be, quote, reducible, unquote, to brain processes in the sense of reductive materialism, a viewpoint which I criticized in the psychology of self-esteem, but without conceding the reductionist position, we can certainly grant that there is a great deal to learn about the interaction between mind and brain and all of the natural sciences which are involved in any aspect of the study of the brain or the nervous system will be playing a contributory role in those investigations. Yes. Mr. Branding, can it ever be rational to commit suicide because of psychological problems? Well, there's a big jump in subjects. I would say no if I take your question literally. I would say definitely no. Let me explain why. Note, you didn't ask, can it ever be rational to commit suicide? Because I think we could agree there might very well be grounds or times when it would be rationally justifiable to kill oneself. For example, if a person were dying in excruciating pain of some incurable illness and were approaching the terminal phases and uh, finding the situation unbearable, a person chose to take his own life, I don't think anyone could say this action was irrational. Not that he would be obliged to take it, but that he would have the right to take it. And uh, I don't think that one could criticize or quarrel with that if such were the person's choice. However, as your question states, you're concerned specifically with psychological problems. And when a person commits suicide, this represents the complete absence of any hope, the complete disbelief in the future or in the possibility that the future will be better than the present. It's the complete abandonment of all hope. And so long as a person is alive and conscious, and so long as his problems are purely and totally psychological, I cannot see what the rational grounds would be for relinquishing the struggle for his own life, the struggle to find a way to conquer his problems and to achieve some kind of life for himself. I cannot see nor imagine on what grounds one would justify rationally 
the abandonment of one's own life when it wasn't a matter of some excruciating and uncorrectable physical pain, but the pain caused by psychological problems, which is susceptible, at least in principle, to correction. One can't escape the conclusion, therefore, that a person who did this would be doing this as an alternative to facing his problems, looking at them down to their root, trying to achieve a more rational life for himself. Now that may sound strange because you may want to ask, why would a person prefer death to facing his own problems? And yet people do that every day. People who drink themselves to death, people who risk their life in senseless dangers, people who take drugs which contain the potential of destroying them utterly, are all examples of people who are willing to die or to risk death rather than to strive to function as rational human beings. And therefore, strange as it might sound at first impression to think that a person would rather die than face his problems, the evidence is overwhelming that people do that every day. They give up important goals, they give up loves, they give up ambitions, they give up careers, and they give up life itself out of fear. Mr. Brandon, what causes a person to openly and happily admit they are neurotic to anyone they happen to meet? Well, I don't know that there would be only one motive that would prompt that behavior. It's not attractive behavior. It's not a good idea to run around announcing that one is neurotic. And I think there are several different reasons that immediately come to mind why a person might be prompted to do it. And I don't place these in any particular order, just as they occur to me. Some people, expecting to be disliked, expecting to be criticized, expecting to be condemned, feel anxiety at the prospect and wanting to reduce their anxiety, they, in effect, bring about the thing they anticipate. They beat the other fellow to the punch. They say in advance, yeah, I know, I'm terrible, I'm a wreck, I'm neurotic. That way they don't have to sit in trembling apprehension for him to say it first or to say some equivalent, to criticize, to rebuke, or what have you. And I think that this is one of the commonest motives, the desire to lower the anxiety of anticipating disapproval by speaking against oneself before the other person can do it. And there are many forms of this, only one of which is calling oneself neurotic. There are people who put themselves down in many, many ways. They call themselves stupid, ignorant, they curse themselves, they make fun of themselves, they laugh at themselves, they speak an irony about themselves, they use sarcasm against themselves, all of which is pretty cowardly, if you think about it, and all of which is aimed to, as I've said, beat the other fellow to the punch, to name it first so you don't have to wait fearfully for the criticism. Now, what other motives might prompt a person? Well, there are some people, believe it or not, who consider to be neurotic a mark of distinction, a mark of superiority. They evidently don't realize that practically the whole world is neurotic, and they imagine that it's some sort of special distinction which makes them superior to other people. And succumbing to this fantastic fallacy, they are really saying to the listener, or rather believe themselves to be saying, I'm superior. I'm one of those people who are too sensitive to live as the ordinary run-of-the-mill person lives. I have finer feelings and sensibilities which make me a neurotic. Now, I don't know how prevalent that motive is today, because today it's pretty widely known that most people suffer from neurosis to some extent. So that motive might have operated more in the past than it does today. Then there are people who simply like to give the impression that they are frank, they are honest, they are fearless, and it's an affectation. They want to say, see, I ain't afraid of nothing. I'm honest, I'm straightforward, I'm open, I put all my cards on the table, which means that they don't. In other words, no honest person feels the need to announce that every 10 minutes. 
But this is an act. It's an affectation with which to impress people. And that, again, might prompt them to describe themselves as neurotic.